Africa. So welcome everyone to our last this year uh, webinar for NWE Learn. And uh, welcome. We're happy to have everyone here. I'm going to go through some housekeeping real quick and then we'll get started with the presentation. So my name is Anna Thompson. I am the current NWE Learn Chair and host for this webinar. With us today are two of our board members who will be helping moderate the session. Uh, Alert, uh, sorry, Adrian Alert Wong, uh, Wong Gand and uh, Amy Spillmaker. Sorry if I don't come out clear, I have to wear my mask. <laughs> I'm in the office. Um, this session will be recorded and made available on the NWE Learn website in the coming week. That is nwelearn.org slash webinars. And our webinar series will return in 2022. We'll be sending out an announcement, so watch out for that. Um, automatic captions are enabled for this presentation. You may turn them on or off using this your CC button your captions button in your player, depending on the device that you're using. It could be at the bottom or it could be at the top. Also, you may use the chat feature for comments and discussion. Um, so today, we are pres the presentation title is Caring for All and Self in the Online World. And our presenters are uh, Davis Piner. She's an associate professor at George Fox University. I'm Tyler Watts, assistant professor of education at Southern Wesleyan University. And without further ado, I will hand the time over to them. Thank you, Anna. It's great to be here today. It's a, a beautiful day in the Pacific Northwest, but we are presenting by coastal. Tyler is on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. Tyler, what's the weather like in your place? Uh, it's actually rainy, which is surprisingly um, uncommon for South Carolina, but we've got a rainy day over here. Wow, well, we're excited to be here. Um, Tyler and I have been working together since about January on a book chapter on caring for yourself during the online epidemic that we've been going through. And we've noticed um, just within our own universities that there's a pretty massive burnout of faculty at this point. At least at my university, there's there's been a huge turnover in faculty and in staff. And there's been um, change after change after change, change in leadership, change in LMSs, change in um, students. and. So it's, it's been really uh, fun to work with another colleague to really dig a little bit deeper into um, how we can care for the faculty. We talk a lot about caring for students, but we want to talk today pretty much about caring for faculty and staff and those that serve. Tyler? Uh, yeah, so it's great to meet everybody. I'm really glad to join um, this uh, organization and uh, to be a guest with NW eLearn, uh, even from as far away as South Carolina. Uh, so similar to what Dr. Espinor shared, I think similar uh, experiences and feelings uh, at our institution. And so we really sought to understand the perspectives of some of the faculty, particularly faculty teaching online, uh, who may not be as connected to their home institution and uh, just delve into their experiences. For myself, I'm actually joining you from my home. So I um, started at my home institution and then moved into a remote faculty role. Uh, I teach it our, in our graduate programs. So I was telling Dr. Espinor before, you may uh, see uh, we've got our virtual homeschooling area set up over here. You may hear kids. And so it's, uh, I think, just the realities of, of some of the uh, attempts to make things work despite all the challenges is uh, something that is facing faculties, facing staff. And so we're excited to explore that today. I have been working at George Fox University for the past 11 years in uh, multiple roles, but this is the first year that I don't have a physical office on campus. Most of my teaching is online in both the undergrad and graduate programs. 
and in the Doctor of Business programs as well. But um, I also keep, I dabble in my undergrad, and so I get to go in and teach in person one day a week this year, which is really kind of fun, actually. I had forgotten how much fun it was to have live students in front of you and some of the things that you can do that you can't necessarily do when you're actually um, remote all of the time. But like Dr. Watts said, you know, we, we're, we're both na navigating the, our new world here. Okay, next slide. Both Tyler and I work at Christian universities, but we realize that the organization and all of this is bigger than that. And so really, no matter what your belief structure is, it's good to look at the spiritual sides of our experience to check on our work personal life balance and reevaluate how we walk quietly on our planet here. The idea of compassion versus empathy can also come into play, whereas compassion can be defined as sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. It is that desire to alleviate others' distress is what sets compassion apart from empathy which is defined as the action of understanding or being aware of or being sensitive or vicariously experience the feelings, thoughts, and experiences of others. We as educators do our very best to be empathetic and compassionate with our students. But what we are discovering as we move into this field of research that it, 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 the return isn't there for faculty and for staff as well. And so who is it that's giving compassion to faculty and staff and who is it that's giving um, empathy to faculty and staff? And so we'll dig a little deeper on that as we more move forward. Before we got started, we wanted to know a little bit about our audience and, and where you're coming from. And so we could um, tailor some of the recommendations towards the end uh, to your own experiences. So um, we've got a poll here. It's active and you can either access it by going to the web address at slido.com and entering the number there or using the QR code. And uh, after you answer this question, I would encourage you just keep the poll open on a mobile device or on your computer as we have an, a second question that will pop up after we look at the results here. So we'll give you a couple minutes just to uh, head over to slido.com or use that QR code and answer about your primary role at your institution. And as I mentioned, please keep the poll open after answering that question. Okay, generally has everybody had a chance to navigate to the poll and give a response? Getting some thumbs up there, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so primarily we're looking at educational development staff. So that could be instructional designers working in a center for teaching and learning. That's kind of my operationalized opera definition of that. Um, faculty, as well as IT staff or other staff. So great. Uh, that's great to know uh, your backgrounds and to know how we can best uh, just look at our recommendations in, in that lens um, for you today. So the next question, you know, thinking about care, thinking about care for ourselves uh, is just a question of how are you feeling today? This is a word cloud, so I would encourage you to enter in three or um, three to five uh words that capture how the, you're feeling today and you'll see these kind of are popping up as as folks enter them okay that looks like uh generally the same number as the previous poll. Uh, so thank you so much. It looks like a large uh, bulk of us, I think, captured some of what Debbie and I shared in our introductions of tired, busy, uh, energized, good, um, and some variations of those, whether that's overloaded, anxious, buried, um, 
and even some some recommendations of, of some practices there. So that's great. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, we're going to look at some research now that Debbie's going to present related to um, how our colleagues are feeling. Yeah, we we spent like most academics a lot of time filtering through a lot of research and there is actually a lot of newer research coming out on um, a, there's a lot coming out on how students are doing during COVID. But if um, if we really start digging, there's not a whole lot on how faculty and staff are doing. So I've pulled four of the, the top major studies that we're using for our book chapter and just plan on sharing those with you. And so we're gonna start with the first one, which kind of is the basis of all of our work right now. And that is the care theory, Nell Nodding's care theory. So if you would go ahead, Tyler, and um, the ethics of care. So if we move to the next slide, according to care theory, all human beings have two care related needs, the need to care for others and the need to be cared for by others. For all of us who are parents, we it takes a lot of years for our children to start caring for us. But I'm noticing as my children are becoming middle aged that our, our balance is shifting and I am thinking of that in, in light of our uh, faculty community. As new faculty come in, there is a lot of need to care to get them up on board. But as they mature and move forward, they again start becoming caring for us as well. So now Noddings is, is the main name closely identified with the promotion of the ethics of care. And that is the argument that caring should be foundation for ethical decision making. And in her first major work, which is caring in 1984, she explored what she described as feminine approach to ethics and moral education. Well, that didn't go over that word didn't go over quite so well. So in later editions, she uses the term relational and because of the connotations of feminine are kind of off putting. And she said, and don't capture really what she intended to convey. Her argument started from the position that care is basic in human life, that all people want to be cared for. And she also says that men and women are guided by an ethic of care, natural caring, a form of caring that does not require an ethical effort to motivate it. Um, although it may require considerable physical and mental effort in responding to needs, Natural caring is a moral attitude, a longing for goodness that arises out of the experience or memory of being cared for. And just in the past 20 months or so, it's, it's prevalent that we are doing as faculty and staff a lot of caring for others, but the balance has shifted and we aren't really getting as much back. She she identified three primary characteristics of a caring relationship, and that's engrossment, motivational displacement, and response. Engrossment focuses on the importance of being receptive or open to others, paying attention, there's a key word, to them in order to get to know and understand them. This is an important starting point for folks who can appear to be engrossed more with themselves or their intentions and their mission. So um, as we move, the distinction between the offering of care and the successful communication of care is significant. Care theory identifies the completion of care as fundamental to the successful communication of care. Regardless of the good-hearted, well-intended perceptions and behaviors of one caring, care is not care if it's not been perceived, received, and experienced as care by the cared for. Care must be completed in order to be communicated successfully. This is an essential distinction when it comes to communicating love. And as we move farther down and share some of the responses from our colleagues and some of our action items, we will see that, that it's that idea of care is not care if it's not been perceived, received, and experienced as care by others. Okay, let's move to the second one, stress in the workplace. 
Uh, this is from an Educause article just very recently in 2021. Um, she, it, the article is actually called The Staff Are Not Okay. So if you would move the next slide for me, Tyler. Lee Scalera Bassett lamented higher education's lack of attention to the staff well-being in the days of COVID-19. And we can see by our audience today that we're pretty evenly divided between faculty and staff. And I didn't want to um, not have an opportunity to talk about the fact that our support staff for faculty and administration in the universities have also been asked to do more with less over the last um, 20 months. They've always done more with less, but it's gotten really intense in the past few years. Um, it should not be a surprise, but it should be acknowledged that high levels of staff reported that their level of workplace stress has increased since the beginning of the pandemic. This is even more so for professionals who are focused on remote teaching and learning, computing and IT departments, and instructional designers. I personally was hoping this year would be different, but I'm noticing a different kind of weariness in the start of the school year as we are trying to go back into our offices, at least part time, we are still supporting a lot of remote learning. And from week to week, depending on the university, um, we could be remote one week, or we could be in person one week, or our, our students could be going to class and then all of a sudden that they're not anymore. So if you switch to the next slide, I just have taken a screenshot here that you can see some of the factors that are contributing to workplace stress for fat, for, um, for staff and really for faculty. Additional responsibilities or increased workload, 43%. Insufficient staffing in key areas of my work. I think we're seeing this by help wanted ads everywhere we go in our area and even in our my husband's personal business we have not been able to hire people like we've been able to in the past and it's been very difficulty it's been difficult there is uncertainty about the future of our institution and career so tyler do you want to talk about how things are going back east sure um, as a private institution, so we have a greater level of control over what goes on our campus. And I was actually pleasantly surprised, um, despite uh, some of the politicization around masks and, and mandates of that we have a mask mandate on campus. But that's certainly not the case um, in the state and certainly not the case in the region. Just um, Recently, South Carolina higher education institutions have instituted a mask mandate um, after a legal battle. But we see colleagues from um, Georgia, for example, who are having to make the decisions about um, teaching or working in um, their facilities where masks are not required, uh, as well as um, limitations on what you can do in terms of remote work or um, remote teaching. Um, just based on options. So I actually I think similarly was really looking forward to this year. Um, we did virtual um, school for our children last year. And then just a couple of weeks before school started, made that decision to continue with that, at least until vaccines are available. Um, and so I think even for those of us who were remote before and who saw the benefits of some of that elements. I just feel there is that weariness, even talking to my colleagues of, it's just uh, that it's okay to feel weary and tired, even though the circumstances of your work um, have not changed just because of the prolongment, because of some of the uncertainties that happen outside of your workplace. Um, and so that's kind of the experience that I get from my colleagues and then through some of the interviews that we've had um, through this study of just the experience of even uh, our remote folks certainly dealing with a lot of these top choices, um, but also dealing with the, I guess, a little bit of guilt of nothing's changed for me. I'm doing well considering the circumstances, but I'm still tired. I'm still uh, stressed. 
And so um, how, do we, how do we take care of ourselves in those moments? Great, thank you. Most institutions are really pretty good at providing flexibility. And the most common support that institutions are providing were, were more flexible work arrangements. Um, at least in our state, there's been a lot of flexibility with that portion of it, but you, there's still a lack of supervisory guidance. There's a lack of um, team building that that we we are missing. We we had it and didn't know how important it was. Um, I I walked into the office the other day. And I and our administrative assistant, just this big grin on her face is so nice to see people. You know, she's worked all summer in her cubicle without anybody showing up. And so it was um, an interesting response. Usually we don't get the big, hi, how are you? Yay, it's good to see you. Um, everyone is so glad to be able to see people face to face when we can. The next slide, Tyler. It, talks about the impacts of stress on workplace experiences. And I, I don't know about everybody else that probably went, might have been a fun slide shy, uh, poll to talk about, but the, the ability to concentrate while working on tasks. Um, as an academic, it takes me a while to get my brain in gear for a day. And when we have our young parents who are home and they have their children at home and everybody is trying hard to make space for everybody else it's hard to be constantly interrupted and while you're working on your tasks and the practices that we can do when we walk into a, an office and shut our door are really different when you are when you are at home and there's all of these other things that are calling at you, including like I got a puppy during COVID, me and a million other people. And puppies don't care if you're in the middle of a task. They, they're ready to do whatever they're gonna do at that point. Um, the, the interesting thing I found if we move just through it from the bottom is I have been less kind and compassionate toward others. And although it's 8%, I would imagine that 8% normally were kind and compassionate toward others normally. And so it's been really difficult for everybody just via the EDUCAUSE um, data that we were able to glean through. Is there, there's a comment in there. Let's see. Let me see what I've got here. Heather says, in some cases, I found far less interruptions working from home than constant interruption in my office. Wow, that you are fortunate. Good for you. Um, but then again, we have to think about who's who's where. Like Tyler's sitting right next to his kids doing virtual school. The the idea of interruption is really based on the circumstance. So let's move to the next one um, from the time for class. This is um, Titan Partners and Every Learning Everywhere conducted a survey of both faculty and students. We're gonna look at the faculty results that informed our research actually, um, not really the student research on that. So if we go ahead, Tyler. Um, it, it looked at the experiences of students and faculty in introductory courses during COVID-19 and introductory courses could be freshman courses, it could be um, courses as you enter into grad school, and then the sentiments of faculty while geared positively toward online learning were shown not necessarily to be sustainable. So this was the third in a series of surveys associated with higher ed experiences during COVID-19. The results looked at several elements related to student and faculty experience, but we'd like to look specifically at how it relates to faculty well-being and care. Broadly speaking about faculty experiences, 90% of faculty surveyed were engaged in some form of online learning practice. And the survey, particularly when compared to the previous two, show online learning perceptions as reaching a high point and stabilizing. 
The survey respondents did express fears that a lot of the practices made in the interest of being available and accommodating towards students were not sustainable. For example, the level of responsiveness to emails at all hours of the day. Those of us that have taught online for a long time um, feel like you never ever really are out of the office. If you have your phone with you, and you take a peek anytime after office hours, there are going to be student needs. Like last night, I had two students e email me about eight o'clock. And, you know, sometimes I look at them and think that can wait till tomorrow. But I also get a sense of urgency sometimes from students and, and they just needed a quick, hey, you're gonna be fine. Yes, we're gonna accommodate. Yes, that's gonna work. But we are also online all of the time 24 seven for that. And so um, we, it, it's not sustainable. And we thought, at least I thought when we moved into COVID that this would be short term, that when we stopped that at the summertime, we would um, just start up again in the fall. And the fact that we're continuing to do that into a second academic year is it's no wonder we're tired. So if we move to the last slide on the time for class, um, in describing their experiences, the takeaways from the survey confirmed the unsustainable nature of our work during COVID. This is their word cloud that generated were primary, primarily negative associations. In addition to these attitudes, there's other external factors compounding the experiences of faculty the concern about financial viability of the institutions that they work at and job security were explored. And while stable, only a third of the faculty at a four-year institutions are really confident in their university's ability to continue on in, with financial security for them. There's changes in terms of retirement plans and there's changes in terms of um, just the salaries and raises if if we're lucky enough to get them in the future. I George Fox has been pretty good about that. Um, but I feel like again, we are on the the happier side of this. The last one that I want to look out look at is exploring burnout in online faculty. The interesting part of this study is that it's from 2007 which means there's been a lot of people doing online teaching for a lot of years before COVID came in and had everybody become online educators. So if, you, if we move to the next slide, you can see that burnout's been identified as a significant issue amongst those in instructional positions. That includes IT, that includes um, course developers that work alongside faculty. Can, can When you really think about it, they're working with a small portion of the university faculty who predominantly teach online. And all of a sudden, from yesterday to today, 100% are moving that direction. And I just know from supporting my own colleagues that not everybody was able to make that pivot. Uh, very well, and it caused at least in my experience quite a few people to retire that weren't planning on doing that. Um, this study actually would transfer across disciplines and K-12. I work in uh, the College of Education, and so I'm preparing teachers for for work in the coming years, and it's been really difficult to just place students in classrooms for their student teaching. And for a lot of our students, they were in Zoom classes to fulfill their requirements to be able to be certified for next year. And so it's been hard. There's some applications for today. Burnout's been defined as both a psychological and physical response to workplace stress. It's a syndrome and it includes three dimensions, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced feelings of personal accomplishment. Um, it's identified in the process of burnout, both attitudes and behaviors change 
in an unconstructive manner in response to work stress. It, it is depicted the physical and behavioral symptoms of burnout as a reluctance to go to work. Well, that's kind of hard if your office is at home. You kind of have to go to work. At least you're there anyway. Disappointment with your own performance and then an extension of work problems into the home life and an ultimate feeling of when you're isolated like that, then your self-worth has also gone down. In addition to the negative effects of burnout on individual, individuals, organizations also face significant implications and costs associated with burnout. Amongst these negative impacts, organizations experience lower individual work performance, high rates of turnover, lower levels of organizational commitment, lower reported job satisfaction, high health care costs, and decreases in creativity, problem solving, and innovation. And remember, this was 2007, so it's probably exacerbated in 2020 and 2021. So let's find out what our colleagues said. Tyler? Sure. So um, we've conducted several interviews with um, colleagues, uh, primarily those working in online faculty roles, and many of those coming um, from working in fully remote situations uh, with varying levels of access to the university community. So uh, one of the first things was just how how connected are you to the university and in what ways do you feel connected by the university and how do you um, receive that care that you need? How is that perceived as um, Debbie was talking about earlier and uh, some of the questions around that. And so we uh, have gathered these into some themes that we'll explore and then move on to some some recommendations or suggestions from our colleagues and what they shared. Um, Debbie, did you have any other additions to kind of the participants from your side? No, we're, we're continuing to gather research as we go um, and working on a book chapter, but I think that this gives us a good start. Uh, so I've put a couple of key quotes here. You can um, take a look at those, but I uh, won't necessarily read those for you, but give you some time to take a look at them. Uh, but wanted to share the first theme related to work-life balance, which I think was um, one of the areas that came out from the existing research that Debbie shared, and um, just some recommendations and suggestions from our participants here. Uh, so it was a huge priority for the faculty we talked to, and I think from primarily from firsthand experience, we're aware of the detrimental effects of not fostering this area. Um, so colleagues shared how it can be a rough road, that there can be isolation, and that can be a significant factor in um, determining what that work-life balance looks like. Ensuring that exercise, I know we had um, one of our participants mention meditation, um, other elements for recharging that had to be non-negotiables was a key factor for those um, that participated in, in our interviews. So from the first quote, you can see that family time, spiritual time, they had to schedule that in and make it a priority just as much as those elements of meetings or posting grades or um, completing uh, grading. And um, paying attention to the hours that students need you most and working your schedule around that was one recommendation and um, one thing that came out from this theme. And then using the time that you know students are not going to be asking um, for help, or you know that faculty are not going to be asking for help and using that time to regroup and rest and develop a routine and flow around that. Um, and I thought the, the last one was really important that viewing boundaries as a big part of self-care. So uh, this person describing just kind of how this has developed over time was saying that they're much more comfortable saying no to non-required activities now uh, than perhaps even just a few months prior. Visibility was another theme that came out and colleagues emphasized just an intentionality towards visibility that was necessary in every interaction um, for, for those faculty that shared. They shared that because of the distance, because interactions might be over email, 
um, where nuance was minced or in meetings where they might not see what extends beyond the screen. They needed to be clear, um, intentional, and really focus on communication. And this goes not only for being visible within the organizational structural uh, organizational structure, but also visible for how faculty are presenting themselves to students. Um, and I think to the degree that we can be vulnerable to our students and be okay with that is a big part of that visibility. So some of the, the quotes just saying that it's easy to be off the radar of um, folks at the university, that you're out of sight, out of mind, and um, that reminding students of what your role is, is an important piece and um, communicating what that looks like uh, for your students. So both that when problems arise, how students can communicate to you, but also setting expectations for students um, of how you're going to communicate with them when problems arise on your end. And so I think this can be true for our relationships with our colleagues as well, and being visible, being intentional with um, how we work with each other. Hey, Tyler, can I just, um mention that the second part of the first quote, those who don't know our programs and have never taught online are making decisions for faculty and staff without understanding some of the, the more detailed nuances of being involved in that. And that um, will, has also caused some concern amongst faculty. Yeah, I think that when I read that, that resonated with me because we have um, uh, institutional leaders at places where I've worked where they have never taken an online course or known what that experience is like to be a student in an online experience. And so how can we help them to better understand what that experience is like? Great point. Thank you for, for calling that out. Uh, kind of in line with this visibility is this understanding. So. Um, this emerged in conversations with online faculty, maybe those that work with faculty in online spaces, feeling that their work and their role within the larger institution was not well understood. Um, this included worries often associated with remote work uh, because it was not visible to a supervisor or others, that they may not be working as hard as others within the institution where that's um, not necessarily the work is visible, but the person is visible as being present there. Um, one individual also shared, also shared that this element of understanding even extended beyond the institution with their own family, um, assuming because that they taught online that their time was flexible, that they would be generally available, and that wasn't the case. So you can see that kind of in the um, second quote there. Um, I think generally, what I see is a better understanding of the online environment, but there's also the um, the danger, I think, when we look at research in, in online learning of that what happened um, as a result in response to COVID is not necessarily the norm for online learning. And so equating these two, explaining the differences can be a challenge for us who work in that field. And then a final theme, um, this was largely related to asking individuals for their advice for others in their position, how they sought care from their institution. Um, so those who responded discussed the challenges of being away from the institution, finding their role and their place within the institution, uh, even just determining the protocols and processes that are required to navigate sometimes unseen norms and cultures, um, but also reflective of the impact one has and giving yourself grace in those moments. So um, the, the first quote there of just someone not knowing who to go to or who to ask, and it's not anyone's fault. It just takes time to be aware of those. Um, and then finding your roles, especially if that's something that maybe isn't necessarily on your job description, um, but is something that will be impactful and will help you connect with the larger community, while at the same time finding ways in that you're establishing those boundaries because everybody is being asked to do roles that are not on, on their job description, as we saw in the earlier research. Yeah, as, as Heather shared in the, um, the chat there, those boundaries, exercising boundaries, finding those boundaries um, as something that everyone in, in this 
um, discipline has been struggling with for a long time. And so I think um, as we look at some recommendations, it'd be great to get your input and to share uh, some of the input from our participants on how they're doing that. Okay, just we have a few recommendations for practice and I, I wish I could say that we found earth shattering new things to do um, to make life easier, but unfortunately, I think we're more reminders of what we're looking towards. So the first one is um, guard your time, block out your work week, um, use your calendar to your advantage and schedule in your personal times. I actually have started scheduling in exercise. I don't like it to start with, so I have to schedule it in just to remind me to do it. But um, you, try and streamline your processes. Um, I find I work better in my grading in the afternoon. I work better in my planning in the morning. So trying to, to do that um, makes more sense for me. And then I also I think I've thought more deeply about the assignments that I'm giving to my students in terms of my grading time, that there's a lot of things that our students can actually do for themselves. I'm using more peer review, which is really, it's been fun and I've been so impressed with students who are able to give a lot more and in-depth feedback to their own peers than I would having to give feedback to 32 students there. Um, considering the structure of your course dates, I think Linda wrote down that sometimes our students, our due dates aren't very reliable. Uh, if you give a due date of a Friday, but you're not planning on grading until Monday, there's no reason students can't have a little extra time. And you can work within your parameters as well. And so um, I use a lot of pre-recorded screencasts to communicate to students. Um, I find it easier to screencast than just to write a big, huge, long weekly announcement for them. And especially if we're only online, even with no Zoom, at least they get a chance to see my face and to hear my voice. The second recommendation, kind of, it, it feels not non-intuitive, but keep on learning. Um, can, well, you're all here, so you're already doing it. Consider webinars, reading articles, and growing your own skills as part of your day, and not necessarily as something that is after hours. I've also, I've always felt um, since I started in academia that I had to be actively doing, doing something when I'm working, like I have to be charting a class, I have to be grading papers. And it took me a few years to realize that I can sit down and read and that is still considered working. I can take a webinar and that is still considered working. Um, I think it's, it, it's the way we think about how we're learning that keeps us in this active, active, active mode when we don't necessarily have to do that. One of our graduate faculty members said, I like to learn. So I've done a number of webinars and readings to assist in new pedagogies and technology. And some may not call it self-care, yet at any time we improve our pedagogy, it can save that commodity of time in the future leaving room for other things that really do give us fuel. So the third one is uh, seek and advocate for your support. Be candid with your students, with your coworkers, with your leaders, with your family. Um, I grew up with a mother who said, buck up every time I had some sort of concern or complaint. And I'm not sure that that's the best advice during COVID. We can only buck up so long before we fall down. And so um, find find your special colleagues that you can talk to about, you know, I'm feeling tired. Do you have some suggestions? Um, I have a boatload of grading. What is What is the most important things to prioritize? What are the things that are keeping me up at night? And it's really easy to feel disconnected from the institution when you're in an online role particularly if you're remote. And um, 
For one faculty member just starting at a new institution, she described it as very welcoming, but you don't know what you don't know as far as the culture of the school. Being introduced through Zoom or a virtual meeting, you can't really see the screen. You don't know what you might be missing. And it's hard to get everything that I need and being on track. I've had huge empathy and compassion for our new faculty who've come into the university at this point. And the, um, as much as support as our IT and our, our folks are giving, that lack of just faculty support, hey, let's get a cup of coffee, let's do this, it just doesn't work on Zoom. You know, you go tell somebody, go get your Keurig and you get your coffee and you both sit there and you're drinking, but it's just not the same as being with somebody. And then number four, make your work prominent. Faculty who are not teaching online most likely don't see the work you're doing or understand the level of preparedness and involvement that it requires. When I shifted to more online learning, I was surprised at how I felt the need to get my whole course done before it started. That is a whole different teaching strategy than the week by week by week. And so you, we have to advocate for our experiences. And I think that um, when, when we think about the two weeks before school starts when we're on contract and we have a million meetings, that's when it's the most intense for online faculty to get their courses up and running for students. And then I think we have to celebrate our achievements among faculty and, and sharing students' emails of encouragement. Students constantly give me joy. They really do. Um, they, they tend to be a bit more needy than they have been in the past, and there's a lot more learning accommodations. But when I get encouraging emails and encouraging words from them, it's that much better. I'd never considered just sharing that with my department and letting them know the fun things that are happening here. And then lastly, give yourself grace. COVID stress, your job may not have changed, but likely everything around it did. I was teaching uh, a year ago in the spring when we made the move um, to online and remote teaching. And I was teaching a doctoral level course that was asynchronous and online. And I thought, well, it's not going to really impact my course anymore because they're already doing it. And within the first couple weeks, I had students um, adjusting to everybody being home all of the time. I had students adjusting to going remote in their own workplaces and the stress that that was taking on. I had students who were ex uh, working and caring for extended family and, and working with students whose family have COVID. I also had a student who, if he couldn't get to the library, then he didn't have access to internet. And if you're taking a complete online course in a whole online degree and you have limited or spotty access to the internet, it, it adds these multiple layers to what the students are stressing about. And so I found that I was doing a lot of modification and changing on a course that was just strictly online or asynchronous. And so, um, you know, I think we have to, in all of this, we have to learn to give ourselves the ability to take a break and give ourselves grace as we continually pour out all our energy to the students. I, I like the picture because I thought of the glass half full and the glass um, not half full and the fact that we constantly have to replenish. Otherwise, we are not able to give back to our colleagues and to our students that which we know we can give. Tyler, do you want any, any closing comments on that? Yeah, I, th I think this this can be a hard space with this, this grace area because it requires us to be vulnerable with other people and to admit when uh, things are not going well, and that can be hard. I'm 
the first person to to kind of take that but i've really tried this last year to be open with my students about hey this is this is what um i'm experiencing um and uh communicating to when is a grade going to come in because of that um being open with them in those regards and students have been um really gracious back and i think that comes from a, a place where if you really work on establishing that trust and that communication at the be at the get-go then students are going to reciprocate um and so i think that goes back to what we looked at it in care theory of just is is the grace uh is the care that you're offering um going to be received is it the care that's needed at that time and so um all of that requires some vulnerability so you know is that something you take with your supervisor right away maybe not but with a colleague with somebody you trust um and establishing those relationships is going to help to be able to make those steps towards um that vulnerability that you need so uh, hopefully that is something that you can identify the people in your workspace the people um that are colleagues or uh, outside of uh, workspaces that can can be there for you in those times of need. Well, I think that that is about what we have. Um, we do have a reference slide that um, we can put up and the slides will be available as well. I've, I've sent those to Anna and she can send them out through chat. I would love to hear and even if it's only through chat, um, some of the the experiences that you have, maybe that we haven't we haven't mentioned, that have provided some encouragement for you as you've moved on. So, if or any questions that anybody have. So Amy had the question: Do you have any tips for identifying burnout in students? Tyler, do you want to grab that? And I've got a couple thoughts too. Sure. I mean, I think, so I teach primarily in an online environment. So you have the, the tools available to you to see when, when students are just disengaged um, and who are not connecting, whether that's through some of the um, ways that we can use some of the analytics of, are they they're just not logging in or are they um, being in their discussion uh, or activity in the the course is limited is coming late um and you know the first thing i think is is what are the ways that i can really get to know the students and to be able to pick up those those cues as they're happening um is one way using those tools that are available but um you know i, I think one thing that a colleague said in, in these interviews was giving students the permission to be vulnerable in that way so stating if very clearly at the beginning of, of the course if you have an issue reach out to me if something's going on in your life let me know and you know i might have that same approach but i didn't i don't state it in my class and so students might agonize or think overthink well, how do i reach out to my instructor in this way or how do i um bring this up with them and so putting that out there for students to acknowledge that early on i think can be really helpful in that and that was something that resonated with me from one of my colleagues. Debbie? Yeah, Linda, Linda Samick said multiple excuses for lack of excellence or late submissions. And I think um, that that we have to we have to look at how our students are turning in and their their work. And yeah, I, I agree that that was um, that's one for me. I think that, uh, Amy, I think that the tips for identifying burnout in students is kind of the same as with faculty. Um, that they kind of go silent. They go AWOL and they aren't, their discussions are limited. Their work is late and it's hard to catch at the beginning. But with faculty, I think, and staff too, this idea of, of compassion and empathy um, really has to permeate a workspace. And as much as an individual faculty member can uh, work within that, I think that our administrators and those are our supervisors um, could use 
some thinking about that as well. Of course, I jumped right in there, but I do think that everybody needs care and everybody needs to care, which is kind of the whole point here. Well, Amy, are we about done? Um, sure, we had like three minutes left, but unless there are any other questions. Great, great, amazing presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Tyler and Debbie. This was amazing and is so needed during this time. Um, it's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I got a lot out of it. And uh, it is always such a great reminder that the there are many things, as you mentioned, it was reminders more than just, oh, this is brand new advice, you know, for, for stress, for burnout, for taking care of ourselves. It's tried and true. Oh, I can't remove my mouth mass for a bit and uh, <laughs> hi <laughs> and so we really appreciate uh, everyone who joined us and thank you to the both of you uh, for this wonderful message to all of us uh, we put uh, links to the slides on in the chat as well as a link to an evaluation form so you can give your the presenters uh, your feedback and um, also, if you have, if you want more information about NWELEARN and upcoming webinars, keep on checking our website at nwelearn.org. And uh, you can go to the webinar section of the website. Also, just a quick reminder, um, our Northwest eLearning Journal is, uh, we publish our first issue this year and we are accepting, uh, applications or uh, articles for publication for next year too, so they can go through the peer review process. So I, uh, we put the link on the website as well for that. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Tyler and Debbie. We'll thank see you, you guys. <laughs> yeah.